We begin the season of Lent today, and for many Christians, and especially Catholics, that involves the Stations of the Cross. Father Andrew Gobrich, the Associate Director of Vocations for the Holy Cross Community, helps us learn how to make the most of this valuable devotion in his new book, You Have Redeemed the World. And Father Andrew, welcome back to the show. It's been about three years. And first of all, let's explain the ashes on Father Andrew's head. This is not a bad makeup job by our man, <laughs> Dustin Roberts. Uh, this is part of the celebration of Ash Wednesday for those who are not familiar. Mm -hmm. We start these 40 days of preparation we call Lent with Ash Wednesday. And the ashes are a reminder for us and for one another of this penitential season that we're all sinners. We all stand in need of God's grace uh, through faith and through trying again through prayer, fasting, and almsgiving to grow in that faith that he's given us. And so the ashes serve as a reminder, not just to us, but communally, which we hear in the Bible many times, that God called this whole community to repentance, uh, to return back to him with their whole hearts. And so as Christians, we gather these days, hopefully, to grow in holiness together. Not just as individuals, but it's a great thing about being a Christian, right, is we don't have to grow alone. <laughs> we have brothers and sisters in Christ who will help us along the way. And this is a visual reminder for us of that. And so. Father got out early this morning. I, I was working. I've got an excuse. I'll be there <laughs> later today. Uh, besides this book, where has God led you since you last joined us? So last time I came here, I was working at a parish in Arizona, a big parish. Uh, mm -hmm. We had 4,500 people who had come to services on Sunday. We baptized hundreds of people a year. It was really dynamic and a great ministry. Really loved it. Uh, but since then, my community asked me to do vocations ministry, which means I spend my days working with young men who are discerning a call to priests in religious life. Uh, they want to give their lives to God. They want to serve potentially, but they're struggling to hear his voice. And so my role day in and day out is to help them learn how to hear God's voice in their life and how to respond to his call with faith. As we were talking, I said you look fairly young, really young, actually. So how long have you been in the priesthood? And where, what is the procedure or the process? I told you that I watched Oprah mm -hmm. in the making of a nun, and it was so interesting. So tell me uh, how long you've been in the priesthood and what actually happens when you mentor these men. Well, I've been a priest now for three years, and so this is uh, something I'm getting a little bit used to now, so I'm glad I still look young. I remember right after I was ordained, actually, there was a woman who was in the elevator with me at the hospital who looked over at me, and you could tell, she, I think ministers often get this look sometimes, where she wanted to ask me a question. I was like, this is going to be interesting. So she goes, <laughs> are you a priest? And I said, yes. And she says, a Catholic priest. And I said, no, I was just at a Holiday Inn Express last night. Uh, I said, no, I am a Catholic priest. And she said, I know they made them that young. And I said, well, there are a few of us. But there is this long process that we go through. Uh, for my case, it was seven years of preparation because, of course, the world we live in is very complex. There's a lot of different questions that the gospel has to engage that we have to take the scriptures and the tradition we've been given to try to answer the questions of our day and that's increasingly complex so there's a lot of study that goes into being a priest a lot of spiritual formation and also what we call human formation because to be a good priest to be a good minister you have to be a good human being first you have to be a good disciple of christ initially and so part of our initial formation is that growing in our humanity growing in the gifts that god has given us and then having the study of scripture and tradition and prayer along the way to help us serve. So it's about six years. And another reason it's that long is because there's a grand period of discernment that goes on here. There, there's a lot of people that think that they want to become priests, and then they realize maybe that's not exactly where God is directing them. You, you mentioned you help people hear the voice of God. How do you do that? It's a great question because we're all trying to do that in our lives. All of us are trying to do yeah. God's will and respond to his call. We usually tell the guys there's three main components to discernment, which is that big word to describe trying to hear God's voice. The first would be self-knowledge. We need to come to know ourselves. We need to know who we are in terms of personality, the gifts, the spiritual gifts and the talents God has given us, because of course his call is probably gonna be tied into the way he's gifted us and graced us. The second component we tell them is we need to have good knowledge about what we're discerning. So whether that be marriage, priesthood, or other ministry, or as a missionary, as a doctor, we need to know what we're discerning and have knowledge of it. I can't discern whether I'm called to be a doctor or not, whether I, if I don't know what being a doctor involves, what that work is. And then the third thing is teaching guys how to pray. And that's, of course, the most important thing because prayer is really when we do tune our ears into God's voice. And for a lot of the guys I work with, they're really good at talking to God. They're not really good at listening to God. <laughs> and so part of what we have to teach them is uh, praying with scripture because that's where we come to hear and know God's voice most powerfully from the beginning. And then especially helping them learn to sit with silence, uh, learning to give God a chance to speak back to them. Uh, it would be like an interview where you just kept asking me questions the whole time and never gave me a chance to speak. Well, I couldn't say my part. But sometimes we do the same thing with God. We sit down for prayer and we talk, 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 and then we go 
back to the rest of our lives and we wonder, well, why God hasn't said anything to us. I, I've heard some of those things before. <laughs> yes, for sure. <laughs> Tell me something, what happens, I know you're excited when a young man says yes and he makes that final step during the, at the end of the seven years. What, what happens when a young man says, this is not for me? I'm just as excited uh, okay. because I grew up with a dream of being married and having a large family. Like I always said, I wanted to have eight to 12 kids and I wanted to have a wife who I'd lay down my life for um, just as you know, we're called to a marriage. And that was my dream going up. I ended up being a priest because this is where God called me. So my discernment at times was a little bit tricky. Um, there were conflicting emotions, desires mm -hmm. in my heart. I really believe this is where God led me, but it wasn't always the easiest path along the way. And so I right now have never been more alive, more filled with joy, more filled with hope, more filled with love, because I believe I'm doing what God made me to do. I've found my calling or my mission in life. And I want others to find that as well, too. If it's as a priest in Holy Cross, fantastic, we'll take them. Mm -hmm. But if they're called to married life, if they're called to another form of ministry, I'll rejoice with them, too, because that's what we need as God's people, as church. We need all of us to find our vocations and carry them out faithfully. So I'm just as excited when a guy finds his vocation, if it's to married life or to another ministry, as if they find it to priesthood, because that's what my work is to do. It's not to recruit. I'm not a recruiter. God's mm -hmm. the recruiter. My job is to help people hear his voice and respond to it in faith, because if we look at the Gospels, right, who are the first people to say yes to Jesus' call? Well, they were the disciples of John the Baptist. That's what we know from the Gospel of John, that the first people to hear Jesus' call to follow him were John's disciples. Well, why? Well, they had been prepared by him. They had been prepared by him to know the Lord's voice, and he specifically called them to repentance, uh, to turn away from their sinful ways, but also, I think, to overcome their fears. And that's a big block for a lot of us. They had to overcome their fears. So if we can help young men and young women do that, they can hear God's call and respond to it as well, too. And that's the great joy of what I get to do. You and your fellow priest, Father Kevin Grove, a, a brilliant young man, wrote this book, You Have Redeemed the World. I, I mentioned today on the radio that Lent isn't just for Catholics anymore. It's for all of us as Christians. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, the Stations of the Cross are for everybody as well. Talk about this devotion and what makes it so special. Well, the devotion grew, as we were talking before in the preparation, from the pilgrimages that Christians made to the Holy Land. I think pilgrimage to the Holy Land is hopefully something all of us can do at least once in our life, right? Because one of the big truths of our faiths is the incarnation, that God became man, that God sent his son to become one of us and walks the face of this earth. And going to the Holy Land is where that really comes alive to us, I think, in a very special way. So pilgrims would go to the Holy Land and they would walk, in particular, the last steps of Jesus' life, what they call the Via Dolorosa, because although all of Jesus' life and ministry is captivating, if we're honest, I think at the end of the day, we're Christians because of the cross. Mm -hmm. We're Christians because of the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And so the most important part of Jesus' life are those last days from when he's condemned by Pontius Pilate to where he dies for us on the cross. And so the Via Della Rosa marks those steps in the Holy Land, but not all of us can make pilgrimage. So the devotion of the stations grew out of the fact that we want to have all Christians be able to, in a way, spiritually make pilgrimage with Jesus in those last steps. And so the devotion covers 14 stations or steps as Jesus was led from his condemnation by Pilate to the crucifixion. And the devotion lets us spiritually walk with Jesus in those steps. We're all called to imitate Christ. Right. And this devotion calls us on to imitate Christ, especially in those last moments. And I always like to say for people who haven't prayed it, if you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson, that is a visual representation mm -hmm. of the Stations of the Cross. Very much so. Uh, that he, from the beginning of that movie to the end, follows Jesus' last steps and is visually inviting us to pray with him in that movie and to enter into imitation of Christ. And so that's a visual representation of what this is a written version of. Well, I know that when I walked the Via Della Rosa in, in Jerusalem, I, um, I was just so impacted and transformed. When we, when we read uh, or read the devotional, praying the stations daily, what can we expect at the end? I mean, as we go through this process, what will be the fruit of it? I think the biggest fruit for us is the fruit that we're all lying for is conversion. Okay. Uh, nothing I think calls us to conversion for, moves us to conversion more than seeing what Christ did for us. And what he did for us was he suffered and died for us. And that really gives us the motivation, I know for me and my own personal devotion of praying it, to lay down my life for him as well, to lay down my life for my brothers and sisters in need. When I'm growing lukewarm in the faith and when Jesus wants to spit me out, <laughs> it's <laughs> looking back at his passion and death that gives me the motivation and the energy I need to keep going on. And what these stations do in a powerful way is remind us that we walk as Christians those very same steps in our daily lives. Our founder, Blessed Basil Moreau, said you really don't have to go to the church or go to the Holy Land if you want to walk the Stations of the Cross. 
we walk it in our daily lives as Christians. So if I'm a mother, single mother, married mother, and I'm devoting my life to my children, I'm going to have to lay my life down for them. I'm going to find that there's suffering and self-sacrifice in that. As a priest in my ministry, I'm often called to things that take me beyond what I think my tasks and talents are or demand from me something that I don't think I have to give. So in being faithful to all of our callings, we live out in our daily lives those last steps of Christ. So what this devotion, I think, can allow us to do is connect what can often be disconnected from us, that waking up in the middle of the night to take care of my sick child or going to work uh, and going through the trudgery of that, that there's a significance beyond just that day-to-day life, that those sacrifices those ways in which I lay down my life are connected precisely with what Jesus did for me. And that devotion helps us connect what sometimes we can feel a disconnect in. For our Hispanic viewers, this book is also available in Spanish, and we want to make sure that you know that there's an outreach for you as well. Vocation.nd.edu has more information for this. If you can't remember that, just visit our website at harvest-tv.com. Father Andrew, thanks a lot for being with us Thanks for having me. It was great to be with you. Thank you, Father. And we're back with more Harvest right after this.